If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Numbers chapter 20. We'll be starting in verses 2 to 5 in just a moment. Uh, But again, if you're new, uh, we have started last September. We began this incredible three-year journey through the Bible that we've entitled Heart Strong. And uh, so we started in the book of Matthew, and we are now in the book of Numbers. And it has been quite the journey already, hasn't it? The book of Numbers is very, very rich, and uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor as a church and as a pastor uh, to be given the permission to just sit in these books. Uh, a lot of times what will happen is you'll, you know, you may end up in the book of Genesis here, Matthew, right? You kind of are able to jump around depending on what it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking in this time, but there's something extremely powerful of God saying, read it all, read it all. Journey through every single piece and rest in it. I can't tell you the amount of people that I have had great conversations with as they've asked, how has HeartStrong been? And especially with other pastors in different cities, I said, you know, it's been a real treat. You know, this past Father's Day, I spoke from Leviticus. And they're like, you did, did you? I said, yeah, I did. And it was really cool. I was like, we're talking about Aaron and his sons and, you know, how God was just doing so much. And Aaron's sons didn't really listen. And they went into the temple and God killed them on Father's Day. And they're like, how did that go? I was like, well, luckily we didn't stop there. We kept talking. But it really is powerful to not just pick and choose, right? To really journey through. And I know hearing from yourselves as well as you each have been going through uh, these readings that it's been really, really beautiful to spend time in these books. And so if you are new or if you haven't yet, it is not too late to join HeartStrong. Dive into the book of Numbers. You can head over to our website, head over to heartstrong.life, I think it is, .ca, uh, where you can join in on these incredible readings. There's so many different ways uh, to really begin to eat the words of God together as uh, we each and every morning, each and every week, take time to sit with him at the throne. Before we dive into this book, I do want to give a special thanks to all of those who were able to be here yesterday for La Vie Boutique, Uh, Pastor Cassie and all of the incredible volunteers that I've spoken with already have told me just how incredible all of these things were, and uh, we had over 50 volunteers here yesterday to serve our community, and so again, thank you, thank you, thank you from the depths of our hearts. For those of us who were unable to be there, church, we thank you, we thank you. Thank you for being here to meet with the congregation. We thank you for being here to be able to dive into community with each other. I heard there was a lot of laughs, it was a lot of work, and there was some good food. And so, I mean, what more do you want, right? It's absolutely amazing. So uh, for those of you who were able to make it, thank you so much. If you haven't had the opportunity to be a part of outreach here at the Canada campus, please, please, please find someone who knows someone who knows someone and get involved. It is definitely worth your time. All right, let's dive into our message today. Over the past past few weeks, we've been talking about the Israelites and really developing the story of Numbers. Now, Numbers is a story about a people who are somewhere, but would desperately like to be somewhere else. And someone said, amen, right? This is a story of people who they have, have the promised land, this land overflowing with milk and honey. This is what God has spoken to them as he led them out of Egypt. It's what he encouraged them as he began to share with them all of the incredible things that he was going to do. As they set up the tabernacle and set up the priesthood and all of these different things, it was also that when they arrived in the promised land, that they would be ready to allow God to sit with them as they cultivated that space. Now, what they didn't understand and what we've read over the past couple of weeks is just how long it was going to take them to get there. Now, along this journey, we have discovered together that these individuals that are present in this incredible story are doing two things. They're becoming someone who will one day end up somewhere. They're becoming someone who will one day end up somewhere. And I think that these are two irrefutable realities for each and every one of us. Church, think of your own life. You are someone today going somewhere. And it may look mighty different from what you thought it would be years and years and years ago. Some of us today did not anticipate that God would call us to Canada. 
Some of us today, maybe you're growing up and you're much like myself or like my oldest son who, when you're in kindergarten, you're asked, you know, what would you like to be when you grow up? And you said fireman. Or you were like my son and you said, I want to be a jelly thrower. And the teacher said, can you draw that for me? And you draw a picture of this sick person throwing jelly through the air. And she's like, that's what I thought you said. Okay, that's right. If you see Sawyer today, just ask him how his journey towards jelly thrower is going. It was amazing. But maybe you had ideas of what your life would look like. Maybe you had ideas of where it was that you would end up. But as we begin to make those crucial decisions, some of them may seem small, some of them may seem large, our journey can begin to take a different path. One of the encouragements from the book of Numbers is that no matter where you are in that journey, that God has a destination for you. That where you end up, that where you are going, the promised land that is in store is not by accident, it's not by coincidence, but as we surrender ourselves to God, God will lead us to the place where he wants us to be. Now, these small decisions may look insignificant at the time, but they can really dictate where it is that we end up or where we are going. Last week, we looked at the Israelites as they were on this journey, and it was full of groaning and complaining, henceforth always to be described as fussing. This week, we see another small thing that God will see differently. In Numbers chapter 20, the Israelites are still on the move. They have now arrived in the wilderness of Zin. The wilderness of Zin is a place without water. And they are forced to engage in this deep understanding that church becoming more like Jesus, which has miraculous and instantaneous moments, can also be slow. Christ-likeness is slow. And as we are in this engagement with God, asking him to continually create us into a deeper and more uh, a clear picture of who he is, as we're on this journey, we need to be careful that we do not grow restless, that we are not prone to fussing, and that we are not prone to deciding where to go on our own path. Because though Christ-likeness is slow, sin is quick. And obedience doesn't always feel like progress. Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 to 5 says this. Now there was no water for the congregation in the wilderness of Zin, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word holds weight and power. God, that your word has the ability to transform lives. God, that your word consistently points us to a deeper understanding of who you are. As revealed through your son, Lord, I pray today that, Lord, as we dig into the book of Numbers, Lord, that you would reveal to us and remind us, God, that where there seems to be no water, you are present. and You have not forgotten us. And you've not led us to places of destruction. But, God, you will use each and every moment, significant and as insignificant as it may seem, to transform us into the people that you would have us become, to get to the place to where you are leading us. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that each and every one of us, that we would lay ourselves today down at your feet. God, not my way, not my will, but your will be done. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So the Israelites have come to the place of Zin, and this place is absolutely barren. It is a desert. There is no water to be found. Now, what the Israelites don't understand is that the, the wilderness of Zin is actually closer to the promised land than they have ever been previously in the story. But it's also accurate that it is not a place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. 
And the big picture, a 10,000 foot view look of what it is that's happening in the story of Numbers, they are progressing. But as you begin to zoom in on their lives, it doesn't feel like they're moving forward. Church, when we find ourselves here, it's paramount that we clarify who it is that we are following and what we can do and in those areas what only God can do. In this place of Zen, the people begin to people. They fuss against Moses and Aaron. It's really interesting to pull that out of the book of Numbers, that they don't complain or groan to Moses and Aaron about their situation. They begin to attack. They begin to bring charge. They begin to take their own weakness, their own struggle, their own experience of difficulty, and instead of of, of just commiserating together like we read about last week, instead of just groaning and complaining, they now go to the leaders and say, this is your fault. Why did you bring us here? Why would you take us from Egypt? We saw God working miracles in Egypt. Where is he now? We saw what God was doing through your lives as you were going before the Pharaoh. But where is God at work in you now? They begin to attack those who God has called to lead. And as we dig into these moments of wilderness, church, it can become very blurry of who is the right person or who are the right individuals to follow. And I want to encourage each and every person here today that God will equip, that God will reveal, that God will do incredible things through humanity. Isn't that awesome? Church, you can be encouraged today that God wants to use you. Every time I look at our medical system, I stand back and say, wow. Every time I look and I drive through our roads, even as I swerve away from the potholes, I go, you know what? This is beautiful. Like, look at the things that God has allowed us as humans to do. The homes that we have, the air conditioning that we have, the snow shovels that we have that Paul reminded us of today. And you immediately went to, I don't want to see that thing for a couple more months. Church, God has used humanity to do great and awe-inspiring things. But let us not take our eyes from the one who is the creator of it all. The reason that we are allowed to be creative, the reason that humanity has progressed in technology and medicine and all of these things is that God has created this world to be discovered. Not only is he a creative God, but he is a God who enjoys watching his creation be creative. Those songs that we sang today, the Holy Spirit brought those about so that we could stand back and say, how great is our God. And so in the midst of the wilderness, I want to encourage you, in the midst of the wilderness, when you're looking for people to follow, when you're looking for uh, examples to be set before you, let's always, as a congregation, carry that, that, that primary focus of saying, God, you are at the center of it all. No matter what it is that comes against me, no matter what it is that is said or done to me, God, I will not elevate people above you. See, it doesn't say in Numbers chapter 20 that the Israelites began to bring these charges or groanings to the Lord. No, they go straight to the leadership. They go straight to these individuals and say, this is your fault. What is your solution? Church, when we are in the midst of the wilderness, even if there seems to be no water, it is at the Lord's feet that we will find our solution. In this place, the people people and they begin to fuss against Moses and Aaron. They express the desire to return to slavery. It was easier back then than where it is that we're going now. We saw what God was doing, but what is he doing now? In the midst of the desert, the Holy Spirit begins to move amongst the people and he's challenged them in two things, to go further in and to begin to step further out. Church, can I encourage you today that even in the midst of the wilderness, the Holy Spirit is at work in you while also leading you to a deeper understanding of who he is. The choices and decisions that we make in the desert, the choices and decisions that we make in the midst of the wilderness, as the struggle continues, as the darkness can seem too dark, as the waves can seem too too high, the choices and the decisions that we make in the midst of that carry weight 
We talked about this just over even the last couple of weeks, how the Israelites will spend 40 years in the desert. And Jesus, as he was led to his wilderness experience, would spend only 40 days. The crucial difference being is that Jesus was leaned in fully to where it was that God was in the midst of it all, while the Israelites were constantly trying to look to the left and to the right, to in front and especially behind And so church, as you are walking through these challenges, as God continues to call out to you, will you step out of the boat and walk on the water? Or will you simply stay in the boat wondering if God is there at all? Let's keep reading and find out what happens next. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. You shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And so Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Moses and Aaron begin to go to God in this groaning and complaining. They begin to take the fussing of the people and say, listen, it is not us who will be able to provide the solution. This is crucially, crucially important as we journey through the wilderness to be able to look at ourselves and in what areas is it only possible for God to move. So thankful today for the testimonies that rang out, the encouragement of what God is doing. And church, we're going to see more of that over the coming weeks. One of the things that we've been wrestling through is where is a great place to tell our stories? Through prayerful consideration, one of the places that we have decided to do this, and we'll do it in in an assortment of different places, but one of the places that we have decided to do this is right here on a Sunday morning in the midst of our service to give praise for what it is that God is doing. And what you'll hear time and time again from the things that God is doing in our midst is that these are praise reports of things that we could not do on our own. Church, I want to encourage you today. I don't know the number, but there are individuals today that have spent time in prayer right here at the altars where in one season, wombs were empty. Now, not only are they full, But there are little kids in our nursery who are a product of prayer and the sustenance of our living God. This is the God that we serve. And so Aaron and Moses, they hear the complaints of the people and they realize very quickly, they look around, they don't have any water, they can't produce water, and so they go to the source of all creation. And God has an answer. An answer that they wouldn't have been able to come up with on their own. This is so important for us because when we're in the wilderness, we're going to have questions. Is God worried about your questions? Does God hate you for your doubt? Church, God is with you. His arms are open wide. You can go to him with your questions. Church, you can go to God with your doubt. Hello? We can go to God with those things that are affecting our heart. There are times in your life where the Holy Spirit will actually be leading you into a moment of questioning why so that he can create more doubt or lead you astray. No, we serve a God who wants to be discovered. Come on. There are times in your life where your doubt and your questions are are actually a prompting of the Holy Spirit to say, there is more for you to know. Oh, come on. See, sometimes when we get into those seasons of doubts and questioning, I don't know if it's, if it's just a product of being in church or if it's something that someone has said sometime, but I've walked with people who feel shame when they have questions, who feel shame when they have doubt. But I'm here to tell you today, there is no question that you can, that you can question. Nope. There is no question that you may wonder. I don't know. You know what I'm saying, right? Listen, there's no question that God doesn't have an answer for. There isn't. I can't give you the timeline of when that answer will come. That's the hard part. But our God is greater. Our God is greater. He is the creator of the created. And so there is no question that God won't be able to step into. Sometimes you may not like the answer, but that doesn't mean that he won't provide. 
Sometimes you may not like the timing, but that does not mean that he is not engaged with you. Church, God is in the midst of it all. You can go to him with your questions. You can go to him with your doubt. Don't allow those things to sit and fester. Take them to the Lord in prayer. The Israelites were wondering, where is this water? God begins to speak to to Aaron and Moses and says, there is water available for you. Assemble the congregation and speak to the rock. So Moses and Aaron assemble the congregation. And this is what they say. Numbers chapter 20, verses 10 to 11. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. Check. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels. Oh, wait a second. See, in Moses 26 to 9, the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and assemble the congregation and then speak to the rock. But Moses and Aaron assemble the congregation and begin to speak to the Israelites. He says, hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. And what's the first thing that we see here? Well, I think the first thing that pops out to me is grace. Church, there's water flowing from a rock. That God hears the complaints. God hears the fussing of his people and provides in a way that they could never have anticipated. Provides in a way that they could never have expected. And provides in abundance not scarcity. There is enough water that flows from this walk to sate all of the people and all of their livestock. But it's not enough water for their grain and their figs and their vines or their promigant, or their promigant, prom, promigant, granites? There it is, granites. I couldn't get the R. Pomegranates, because this place was only to walk through, not to rest. The second thing that we see here is that for Moses and Aaron, this becomes a consequential moment. Numbers chapter 20, verses 12 to 13, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself to be holy." We may read stories like this and ask, is it really that big of a deal? Yes, I know God told them to speak to the rock, but Moses struck the rock and it still produced the result. Why then is the punishment for Moses and Aaron here in this scripture so harsh? Moses will not see the promised land Because of this moment, where instead of announcing to the congregation exactly what it was that he had heard from God, instead Moses misrepresents the words of God and manufactures an image or an outcome that he desired on his terms. As you read through the story, it's easy for you to understand that Moses is upset. How many miracles have the Israelites seen? The fact that these hundreds of thousands of people are still journeying through the desert year after year, moment after moment. Is that not enough to prove that God is with them? The cloud is going before them. The fire is leading the way. And yet they still question. And now not only are they questioning God, but they're bringing these offenses against Moses and Aaron. Moses hears from God and realizes that there is a way to be able to provide for the people. But you start to see in in Moses just this, this, this question of, is this even for them? How can I show them that they shouldn't bring this charge against me? Church, can I encourage you today that you do not need to misrepresent God to see God do incredible things? You do not need to misrepresent God to see God do incredible things. You do not need to lie to convince people that God is great. We do not need to step into different situations in order to see God do incredible things. And we do not need to take scripture into our own hands. Amen? 
We do not need to take scripture into our own hands and to create theologies that are never actually present in scripture. When I was growing up, there was a play that was uh, just kind of sweeping across Canada. And I don't know if it was sweeping across the States as well, because I was far too young. But it was called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Anyone remember that? It was crazy. Like crazy. Like it was insane. And so what would happen is you would have a bunch of people come in and it was this, this, this play where um, you would have uh, people just kind of going about their daily lives, moms with their, with their sons, families together. And some, uh, there was one scene with two construction workers on a job site. And as they were going about their journey, they'd be discussing things of faith. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the scene, something terrible would happen. A car crash in the construction site, the the scaffolding fell over, and these individuals would be brought before the Lord. And as they realized where it was that they were, they would see an angel standing with a book. They would go up to the angel and they would ask, is my name written in the book? And you would have these different scenes of individuals who would find out that their name was written in the book and the heavens would open and there was this glorious music and Jesus would come out and people would be crying and it was amazing to see what it is that is guaranteed for those who know the name of Jesus, who have repented of their sins, who've turned away and say, God, lead me, lead me as only you can lead me. And they would be ushered in to eternal paradise with God. But then there was also the other side of people who would approach the angel and ask, is my name written in that book? And the angel would shake their head and you would see out of the corner of, of, the, of the stage. And, and this was at my dad's church. It would always be like just the, the young guy up and coming, like usually one of our worship leaders or something like that dressed up as Satan, and Satan and his demons would come out, and because the name wasn't written in the book, they would drag them into hell. And so there was this, this juxtaposition, there was this counterance of, of, of what would happen at the end one way or the other. At the end of the play, there was always a salvation message given. And when I was coming up in church, there was a lot of stories of fire and brimstone, and eternal punishment, and a lot of focus on hell and the afterlife. Church, can I encourage you today that I don't believe we need to scare anyone into the loving embrace of Jesus? Is hell a reality that's talked about in the scripture? Yes, indeed. Is it something that we need to have a good theological understanding of? Of course. But is this what we need to present to people the very first time that they're ever hearing the name of Jesus? No. No. Do you know what we need to tell them? That God loved them so much that he sent his only son to die for them. That while they were yet sinners, he hung on the cross and spoke the words, it is finished, so that all would have the opportunity to respond to him in grace. This is the gospel. Now, as they are discovering who Jesus is, do not not neglect the full gospel. But I remember watching people fall on their hands and knees before the Lord. And as fear brought them to salvation, it was also only fear that sustained them in the midst of it. Church, can I encourage you today? that our God is a God of love and grace and mercy. He is a God of righteousness and justice. He is all of these things. But my encouragement for you, for your kids, for your family, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, is introduce to them the God who loved the world so much that he sent his only son. And as they fall in love with him, it will also be love that sustains them in salvation. See, Moses gets up. Instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock and produces a miracle that God provides for, but not in the way that God had asked. In Matthew 18, 8 to 9, Matthew says this, And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. 
It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, into the hell of fire. See, Jesus did not hesitate to speak about the eternal consequence of what it looked like to fall away from where it was that God was taking them. What we often forget is when Jesus was talking about eternal hellfire, when Jesus was talking about the realities of hell, he was speaking to the Pharisees. He was speaking to the believers and the Christians of the time, reminding them that misusing Scripture to get what it was that they wanted was not what God had called them to do. Moses was spoken to. He was given a clear uh, understanding of what it was that he was called to do. And instead, to show a little bit of his own frustration, he turned the miracle into something that God never intended it for it to be. Did God still work? Yes. But was there still consequence to what it was that God was about to do 100%? And Moses, as a leader in the Old Testament, was given the consequence of not entering into the promised land with the rest of the Israelites. Church, you don't need to add anything to the word of God. You don't need to add anything to the miracles that God wants to work in your midst. If you believe that God wants to set your family free, then dig into the word and see that there he will confirm that he loves each and every one of your family members, of your neighbors and your co-workers. And you don't have to water down scripture. You don't have to add extra words. You don't have to make scripture fit our culture. Amen? But we can actually speak to the rocks and just watch God do the rest. How beautiful will it be in situations as we continue to watch God do everything. See, Moses struck the rock with the staff, sending the message to the Israelites that Moses had a bigger part in the salvation of the water than God ever actually intended. Some of us see the salvation of our family members and our friends and our co-workers and those that are around us. And some of us are wondering, how could I possibly say the right words or do the right thing to lead them to Christ? Or what if I step into the midst of the story and I make a mistake and I lead them away? Church, I want to encourage you. It is not you who does the saving but it's Christ and Christ alone. Even in the midst of the desert, God was speaking. Even in the midst of the desert, God was setting his people free, meeting their every need, even in ways that they didn't understand. And so this morning, I want to go to a moment of prayer. that we would agree together to not add anything to Scripture. That we would agree together that our culture needs to be transformed by the living Word, not the Word transformed to meet our culture. Come on. That we would agree together that you and I are vessels. We have the great opportunity to watch God send water from the rock. We have the great opportunity to watch God send manna from heaven. We have the great opportunity to trust that God sees each and every person that doesn't know him yet and that the Holy Spirit is crying out to them. We have the great opportunity to be asked, to be present as people's lives are set free. But you don't have to carry the burden of doing that life-transforming work. That's his job. That's his job. And church, he's already done it. And so this morning, I want to do two things. Number one, I want to relieve the pressure 
from some of our family's shoulders today who you have been striving and pushing and wondering how many more things that you can say, how many more things that you can do, what other ways that you could strike the rock to watch the water pour forth. And today I wanna just release people today to rest in Jesus, to return to the power of Sabbath, of resting beside the throne room, standing in front of it and laying all the striving down, laying all your greatest plans, laying all of your greatest wording and and different ways that you could put it and instead just be available. Be present with God because He is the one who will work salvation. He is the one who will give the words that you could never possibly dream up in the shower that morning before work. He is the one that will do it all. And so the first thing I want to do is just alleviate the weight and the burden that the enemy has placed on your shoulders. That if you don't say the right things, if you don't do the right things, if you don't walk the right way, that those that you love will not know Jesus. That's not what my scripture tells me. My scripture tells me that as we follow after him, as we become more like Jesus, that our light will shine in the name of the Lord. That there will be cities that will stop and look at the light of Christ shining in you and take notice of who your creator is. That's what our word says. The enemy would try to bury you under shame. The enemy would try to bury you under insignificance, but not God. And the second thing I want to do is just take a moment to repent. Church, if there is any way that we have tried to manipulate that we have tried to coerce, that we have tried to set things in such a way that people would see God, that we would just take a moment and repent, that God, if we have made this anything that you have not intended it to be, God, forgive us. We lay this burden down at your feet once again. Church, hell is real, but God is greater. And his desire is that everyone would come to salvation. And so you don't have to scare or manipulate or twist the truth or make it easier or lay a heavy burden on people's shoulders. All you have to do is fall head over heels in love with Jesus and let him speak through your life. Is that not more than enough? Is that not more than enough? Let's pray. And so God, I thank you once again for the book of Numbers, for what it is that we can learn through the lives of these Israelites. God, I thank you for Moses and Aaron. I thank you, God, for so many examples in your word of imperfect people following a perfect God. Because God, we fall in the exact same category. Lord, there are times where we grumble and complain and fuss, God. There are times where we hear from you and try to add our own little spice to what it is that that could possibly look like. And so Lord, first thing that I want to do today is I ask right now, God, that you would relieve the burden. God, that you would take the yoke. God, I pray this morning that you would take any of the pressure, that you would remove any of the shame when it comes to those who are praying for loved ones, for neighbors, for coworkers, for our city, for our country, for our world. God, for those of us who are bearing that that, that burden of they just don't know you yet, God, we place that once again at your feet because they do not need to know our version of who you are. God, they need to know you in truth. And so God, make us less so that you can be more. God, I pray that you would take our words and make them your own. God, I pray that every step that we would walk would not be in our own doing, but instead, Lord, that you would guide the steps of each and every righteous person here, Lord God, as we seek to be holy as you are holy, God. May it also come to our reliance. Let our reliance not be in ourselves or how wide or persuasive we can be, 
But instead, God, let our reliance rest on the word of Christ. God, let our reliance rest on the Bible. God, let our reliance rest in your spirit, Lord. Let our reliance rest in the fact that you have created all things and you know all things and you are here with us each and every day. And so God, if there is anyone here that maybe hasn't been sleeping well, or maybe they've been attacked, God, in the midst of their dreams. God, I pray a release right now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that healing would flow right now. God, for those who are walking with the burden of wondering what they can do to set people free, I release that right now. And a reminder that only you can set the captives free. Not that you won't use us in the midst of it, but it is not our burden to bear. Our burden is to run after you, God, in the race that you've set before us. To not be silent in speaking about who our, our sustainer is. And God, I also ask for forgiveness in this place. God, if we have taken passages from Scripture and have given too much emphasis... God, forgive us. Lord, if we have taken the words that you have shared us and twisted them, Lord God, so that it would be easier for those in our culture to receive who you are, God, I pray that you would forgive us. God, we don't need to add anything to your word. Or take anything away. God, I pray, Lord, that we would not be hungry or thirst for any of the glory or any of the honor, or any of the praise. That Lord, when you send that water, that living water for those in this city, may it be only you who receives the glory. Because God, that's miracle enough for us. Lord, if no one knows a single one of our names, but they know the name of Jesus, And God, that's all that we ask. And so, Lord, in your heavenly name, we pray this today. Amen.